Um, my name is Devin O'Dell. I'm a software engineer at Fastly. I work on our uh, core caching infrastructure. Uh, we're based on top of Varnish, so that's sort of my uh, platform every day. Um, personally, I'm a really big fan of performance work and debugging work. Um, debugging mostly because when you do performance work, you have to do a lot of debugging work, so it's just easier to be a fan of it because otherwise your life's miserable. Uh, I'm also a pretty big Frank Zappa fan. Um, and don't know if I'm a bigger Frank Zappa fan or performance fan, but I'm clearly a little bit bigger than I was in that picture. Um, anyway, a lot of the time when uh, people at Fastly give talks, uh, they're talking about sort of our distributed system, the challenges coming with implementing a you know, large global network, um, distributed systems problems. But I'm going to focus at something at a smaller level, so something that happens in our points of presence, our POPs. And in fact, even something that happens on an individual machine level. So as a content delivery network, uh, what we do is effectively caching content for our customers and delivering it to our customers' users and doing that at a massive scale. Um, and there's, there's problems with being able to do that uh, at a systems language level like C. Uh, one of these problems is, uh, as many of you probably know, sharing memory is really hard to do and especially if you need to do that cross-process concurrently. So on a cache node, we may have many processes, and these processes are sort of able to allocate and free memory from their own private heaps. Um, and because there's no real general purpose way for us to uh, share these, uh, any data between these heaps concurrently, safely, or really at all because they're private heaps, um, these processes can't really communicate uh, at least not through memory directly. Um, and it would be really great if we had some kind of system to do that, right? Because then we could uh, shard off sort of problems with uh, things like cache eviction lists or indexes of objects on SSDs um, or, or that kind of thing uh, that, that could help processes help each other complete tasks. So we implemented a, a concurrent allocator. Uh, it's called Microslab. And uh, it allows us to basically do just this. Uh, it's a, a shared state memory allocator that uh, works concurrently between processes. And uh, the talk today is sort of going to be an exploration about sort of how you get from the idea of doing this to making something uh, that performs predictably under a high concurrent load. So first off, as you might have guessed by the name microslab, uh, this is a slab allocator. A slab allocator is a class of memory allocator that hands out fixed sized objects, right? So we don't have the same problems with slab allocators with fragmentation because it's really easy. We can just sort of put objects back in and get them out because they're all fixed size. Um, but what's a slab? Well, a slab is just some contiguous section of memory that's broken up into a bunch of these fixed size objects. And if we want to allocate from this slab, all we have to do is just sort of, you know, what we want to do is call our allocation routine. Um, oops. And apparently that's not going to work. But we pulled objects off the front. Uh, if we want to free them, we're going to free them back. They're also going to the front. This looks like a stack. It is a stack. Uh, it's also called a free list. Um, but we're sort of looking at this from a single process perspective. So what happens if we add concurrency into the mix? Um, and, and really, the question that we need to answer is, how do we actually reason about the correctness of our allocator uh, in the face of concurrency? Well, something that's really useful to do is to sort of define a protocol. So even though we're not really like doing sort of defining message passing semantics or something, uh, we can think of our allocator as, as a sort of protocol where we have requests for objects that receive responses containing objects. We also have requests to free objects back onto the allocator. Um, and those free uh, requests uh, are responded to when the free completes. Um, and I think we probably should all intuitively agree that uh, a request comes before a response. But I'm going to go ahead and make that totally clear, because that's important. Um, that, that's really a constraint, right? And we have other constraints that we can define on our allocation protocol. Uh, so for instance, uh, we can't perform an allocation and have a subsequent allocation return the same object without having uh, an interstitial free uh, and a similar pattern uh, a constraint holds for freeing objects. So how do we describe this? Well, we describe this with execution histories. And in this particular case, we have processes A and B uh, issuing allocation requests. 
um, and they both receive responses. Uh, these requests and responses are interleaved, um, but they do have an order. So the execution history allows us to sort of think about the particular ways that we can sort of order the operations of our, of our software and how it's going to execute. Um, now, it should also be, well, maybe not obvious, but we can also permute these execution histories. So we could reorder these execution, uh, execution lines um, in, in four factorial ways. So we get 24 different particular execution histories. But not all of them are valid, right? So for instance, if we reorder so that uh, B gets a response before it's in its request, that breaks causality and that's mind bending and like we can't do that. Um, so, so we say that this has violated our protocol. Uh, so let's put it back. Um, so these constraints that we've declared on our protocol really help us better reason about the correctness of it. Um, and, and it seems like it, it's providing us a, a way to sort of talk about a, an execution history um, that, that can help us become convinced that our protocol is correct uh, or that an implementation of it is correct. Um, so what other constraints do we need to put on this particular execution history to sort of get some, some better feelings of correctness? Um, well, the first thing that we can do is we can constrain the type of history that we're talking about. So an execution history allows reordering of you know, arbitrary elements and arbitrary orders, uh, but we can, we can talk about sequential histories as well. And a sequential history is a history where any res uh, request from uh, our protocol is succeeded immediately by a response. So this is an atomic, effectively, operation. Requests and responses then become atomic within these execution histories. Uh, and that seems to be like kind of a property that we were missing from our execution history. And if we want uh, concurrent access to our allocator, um, seems like atomicity is something that we need. So what does this look like? Well, here we have uh, requests and responses, uh, and, and they're atomic, which is maybe easier to see if they're grouped like this. Um, the previous execution history obviously was not a sequential history because uh, uh, the requests and responses were interleaved. Um, and what this means is that if we introduce sequential consistency into our allocator, uh, we, we now have a constraint where uh, no allocation can happen uh, with, at the same time as another allocation, no free can happen at the same time as another allocation. So uh, uh, we have this sort of ordering, it seems, of events. Um, but notice that while we can't interleave our requests and responses, that all of these operations have to complete uh, uh, atomically, we can still reorder them all with respect to themselves. Okay? And reordering request and response pairs can still yield a valid sequential history. Um, and so that I, I'm talking about reordering because what we're actually allowed to reorder uh, within a history is about to become really important. So just uh, keep, keep this reordering in mind. But um, first, let's kind of look at some code. Like, what does what is, what is a stack effectively look like? What is our, our free list going to look like? Well, we're going to have an allocate and free interface. The allocation for a slab allocator is just going to read the head of the stack. It's going to read the next element off of the head, and it's going to put that next element as the new head of the stack. Simple. Freeing, uh, we have an object. We just read the stack head. That becomes this object's next element. We make the stack head the object that we're freeing. So what do we have to add to this to, to get sequential consistency? Well, we can just lock, right? We can just put locks around it, and, and right, that's great. So lock-based synchronization is, is nearly like the canonical sort of uh, uh, solution to shared memory or sharing memory in, in multiprocessor and multiprocess systems. Um, and they're easy to reason about, right? Because they serialize access to the critical sections, right? The part in between the lock and the unlock. And uh, this serialization creates a sequential behavior. Um, so that's cool. Let's, let's take a look, actually, at how a lock itself is implemented, right? Because it, it, it's useful to understand the guarantees that the lock makes and how it makes them to really understand why the lock protects our structure. And the kind of lock that we're going to be talking about, uh, just basically for simplicity purposes, is a spin lock. And in particular, we're going to talk about a test and set spin lock. 
Um, so the way that this lock works is that it snapshots the state of the, of the mutex, of the lock resource. Um, it sets the state to locked. And then it says, what was the state of the snapshot when I read it? If the state was locked, we didn't acquire the lock because it was already locked, right? So we just spin. And we keep doing that as long as we have uh, seen that we didn't change the state from unlocked to locked. If the previous state was unlocked, we have acquired the lock, right? So in that case, we just exit. Now, in the case of unlocking, that's pretty simple. All we have to do is set the state to unlocked. We're good. So this is how an implementation might look like in the C language. Um, this code is actually sort of simplified uh, from concurrent, the concurrency kit library, which provides a number of uh, really great interfaces to concurrent uh, data structures, spin locks, and uh, uh, other things. Um, and this looks correct, right? Like this, this basically looks like the sort of flow chart that we just looked at. But how can we reason or define the correctness of this implementation formally? Well, because an atomic operation by definition is individual, uh, indivisible, um, any atomic operations to our mutex, to this m variable right here, are sequentially consistent among themselves. Um, so there's a couple things to notice about this. One is this sort of test and set operation is it actually embedded in a larger sequence of histories, which is actually entering the lock function and exiting the lock function. Um, or, or trying to acquire the lock and acquiring the lock. Um, and in the case of multiple processes, let's imagine that, that process B previously held the lock, right? And process A is trying to, uh, to acquire it. Well, we, we have a stronger constraint, actually, than just sequential history that we have to apply to this, because uh, sequential histories would allow us to reorder these operations, these, these atomic uh, lock release or the store request response in, in process B and the atomic lock acquire uh, in process A. We can't do that because that violates the guarantee of mutual exclusion that the lock is giving us in the first place. So if we've concluded that out of the set of all execution histories we have some subset of sequentially consistent execution histories, it looks like we're even moving towards a stricter subset of those uh, that satisfies some other desirable property. And that property is linearizability. So a linearizable history is a sequential history, but it has an additional uh, uh, constraint on it that uh, request and response pairs cannot be reordered with respect to each other. And linearizability was uh, actually defined um, by the Herlihy wing paper uh, uh, that we saw a few slides back. Um, so what about linearizability is actually better? So this uh, Atiyah Welch paper uh, gives us a couple of properties. Uh, in particular, linearizable, uh, linearizability is easier to verify formally. Um, and this is because linearizability uh, has, has two other properties. Number one, it applies to individual objects. So this is different from serializability in database systems where sort of the, the entire set of multiple operations on multiple objects uh, is, is, uh, gets this sort of serial treatment, whereas with linearizability, individual operations on single objects get this sort of serial treatment. Um, this property uh, of, of applying operations to individual objects also makes uh, linearizable uh, algorithms or, or linearizable uh, data structures composable. So if I want to apply a linearizable operation to some object, all of those uh, uh, operations applied to the objects linearize as well. So given that sort of definition, we might think that there's only one particular execution history here that's valid, which is maybe the one presented. But uh, notice, actually, that we can sort of still reorder the entry and exit of these functions without breaking our protocol. And uh, in fact, we can even reorder it a little bit more, right? So as long as the unlock happens before the lock, this is linearizable. Um, now, it seems that there's something special about these, uh, these atomic instructions. Uh, why, why do they provide this linearizable, uh, this linearizable uh, guarantee? Well, in a, a paper that predates me from uh, Leslie Lamport. Uh, he's talking about uh, inqueuing and dequeuing elements from a concurrent list uh, or concurrent queue. 
Um, and what he's telling us is it's actually sufficient for there to be an atomic moment in, in lock and unlock operations where sort of this transaction uh, appears to complete. And, and this is uh, uh, the paper that's sort of credited for coining the, uh, the term uh, linearizable, by the way. Um, but this atomic moment in our functions uh, is also called a linearization point. And prior to this paper, there was sort of an insistence that sort of the entire function had to be atomic. So this, this gives us a new way of, of thinking about uh, linearizability and how we can apply it to objects. So in our functions that use this lock-based synchronization plan, uh, these, these linearizable moments are anywhere within the lock's critical section. Uh, and with respect to our locking interface, it also has linearization points, which are the atomic operations changing the state of the mutex. So now we have a, a formal basis for understanding our, our uh, lock uh, and understanding its correctness. How does this perform, right? At the beginning, I said, you know, we sort of want an allocator to perform well, and that makes sense because, you know, performance matters. But what do I actually mean by performance? Because that's also a really nebulous term, right? So what I mean is that we get some decent throughput, uh, but we also get predictable throughput with concurrent load. And that's really hard to do. Um, so does our locking strategy provide that? Well, with, uh, uh, so this graph is, is showing uh, the number, average number of acquisitions uh, per second, well, not acquisitions, but lock, allocate, free, unlock uh, operations per second um, across, you know, sort of threads on the, the x-axis. Um, and, and the test was run for 10 seconds. So, Although with no contention, we sort of complete in something like 18 nanoseconds, as soon as we add uh, one thread contending, uh, and you could also think of this as processes if you want, uh, our throughput immediately drops by an order of magnitude, like a factor of 20, 25, something like that. And it continues to degrade as we add more threads, uh, which is maybe easier to see on this uh, uh, logarithmic plot. So we're cl crossing nearly four orders of magnitude um, of throughput degradation as we add uh, contending threads. Um, and this is going to actually put a limit on how our allocator will behave because these operations wrap sort of the, the stack mutation. Um, so recall that this test and set algorithm, uh, the way that it works is it reads the state and then it writes a state and then it tests a state effectively. Well why do we write every time, right? This seems kind of wasteful. Why are we going to go and write some value back to memory every time through the loop? If the lock's already unlocked, why are we wasting these writes and sending them back to memory? Well, it smells like something we can improve on. Um, and sure, we can. So let's introduce this sort of inner loop. Um, and instead of every time we go through our, our lock uh, acquisition, you know, trying to set it to lock, uh, every time through, we have an inner loop that if it was locked, we just wait for it to be locked. So we're not doing any writes anymore, right? We're just reading this memory now. Um, but at first blush, this, this kind of feels incorrect, right? Because what if we've got, you know, a thousand threads or processes in here and aren't they all going to wake up and see that the mutex is unlocked and then race? Sure, they are. And, and this is a race condition, right? A race condition simply said is uh, uh, sort of a, a system behavior where the output uh, or uh, uh, behavior of the system is dependent on sort of the sequence or timing of uncontrollable events, like scheduling maybe. Um, so can they be safe? Yeah, we, we linearize at this atomic test and set that provides us a guaranteed global order of, of operations on this mutex. So race conditions really only become bugs when uh, they happen out of the order that we intended with respect to our protocol. Um, and thinking about race conditions in this way can uh, maybe help us get some additional throughput out of our lock, uh, and later we'll see how it can also help us get even, even more predictable throughput. Um, because if we actually look at the performance, eh, it's a little better, but it's not that much better, and um, more importantly, it's still not predictable. So let's try another trick. Let's add some, uh, some local state, right? So if we implement some exponential back off, uh, now we're not sharing any memory, 
Um, but we might think this is bad for another reason, right? Maybe we're going to oversleep, right? Maybe the lock is uh, unlocked halfway through our back off, and then we're going to sleep for too long, right? Is, is, is that bad? Is that going to happen? Well, no, actually, this turns out to be a pretty decent way to get additional throughput out of our spin lock. Um, however, we still have this like kink in the graph at basically x equals 2, right? And that's depressing. Um, we could probably keep trying like every trick in the book on our locks. Um, but really what it looks like is we're just changing a coefficient in exponential decay, right? Um, and in order to understand why, uh, let's, we're, we're going to talk about something called a progress guarantee. So let's say we've got two processes and uh, some spin lock that's uh, available to both. Um, so we have the first process that enters the function, it switches the state to locked, and then it exits the function. So now it's within its critical section somewhere, maybe. Um, so now our, our next thread or next process comes in. It tries to grab the lock, but it can't, so it's spinning. Um, and it's not making progress. Uh, so there is actually no progress guarantee being made in this system because the first process is not under any obligation ever to release the lock. There's nothing about a locking protocol that defines when an unlock must happen. Um, so uh, furthermore, our second process uh, has no choice but to wait until the unlock happens before it can make progress. So in our total system, we have no progress being made. So that's bad. So maybe we should have a uh, look into something that, that gives us system progress. So uh, we can talk about one thing, which is lock freedom. Uh, and that defines um, a, a system where uh, given contention on some resource, uh, at least one thread or process will make progress uh, at, at any particular contended moment. So you, you get this sort of system-wide uh, throughput guarantee. Um, so maybe, maybe we want to use that solution, and maybe we want to embed that into our, our data structure instead of just you know, simply using locks around these sort of sections that clearly need protection to prevent uh, you know, concurrent access to this uh, from, from becoming a, a race condition that does happen out of order. So this is where non-blocking algorithms come in. So lock freedom is a class of non-blocking algorithm uh, like I said, where we guarantee progress of one thread, uh, at least. Um, and, and it seems like that this might be something that actually provides some of the predictability that we're looking for. So how do we implement something like this? Well, we're not tied to test and set. Processors and, and most modern processors, uh, in fact, all commodity processors for machines that I'm aware of that people are using in data centers, and most mobile devices uh, all support uh, compare and swap, as well as a number of other uh, atomic read, modify, write operations. Um, so what does compare and swap do? Well, given some value and some place in memory, what we're going to try to do is compare these values. If they're not equal, we just return false. If they are equal, we additionally have a new value, and we're going to try to swap that in to the destination. And if we do that, we return true. And now, the processor is providing us also an atomic interface to this. And therefore, we can also use it uh, for linearizing. So if we apply this to the allocator, we get something like this. right? Uh, up at the top here, you can see sort of the stack of, uh, or the, the state of the stack. Um, so if we were executing here, we would, as before, read sort of the state of our stack. Uh, the variables a and b here are sort of corresponding to a and b elements in the stack up there. Um, and the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to try to swap b to be the head of the stack using this compare and swap operation. So if we succeeded, we've acquired a, and b is the new head of the stack. Right? That makes sense. Um, but what if this compare and swap returns false? Well, if we go back to sort of this color-coded example, um, if, if it returned false, then, then we know what happened, right? Either, uh, well, period, the head was changed, right? Somewhere in, in between our read of the head and our attempt to compare and swap. That seems like a race. So, so what could have happened? Well, we could have had some uh, process free 
and now we have a new element at the front of the stack. Uh, maybe another allocation happened and A got pulled off of the stack. Um, so this seems like really racy behavior. But again, because of the linearization point provided by our atomic compare and swap, uh, we, we are guaranteed in this case that um, the, the state we've observed will be consistent. The A is no longer there. We're going to retry. So what about free? Well, free is actually simpler uh, because we only have an object. We read the head. You know, it's the same thing. We try to swap the new object into the head atomically. If we can't, you know, we had another one of these classes of race conditions happen, and we just retry, right? Effectively, this compare and swap is letting us detect a state change and retry. Um, so now this is great, right? We've got this concurrent stack, uh, and the stack is, uh, uh, we can treat it uh, like a free list, so it's, it's our allocator, right? Um, let's just race a bunch of, of threads against it, right? We, we've already seen, like, this is concurrent safe, right? So let's imagine that we have this, this process. And it goes in, and it reads everything. Uh, it reads the front of the, the, the slab head. It's going to read the next element. And it's going to stop executing before it gets to the compare and swap, um, because that's actually a thing that happens all the time. Um, in the meanwhile, we have another process that comes in. And it's got some execution time. So it's going to go ahead and allocate. And A comes off of the, the head of the slab. Um, so let's play this game again. Let's take another process, and it's going to come in. And this process is going to allocate. And B is now off of the slab. So we still haven't uh, executed our, our compare and swap yet, but it's fine because now C is the head. So we'll just retry if we were to execute right now. But uh, instead of doing that, let's say that now our second process decides that it's done with the object that it got, and it's going to go ahead and put it back. Okay. So now we can see we read A was the stack head, we read B was the next element, but now the state of our stack has changed from under us, and this is no longer true. So let's finally do our compare and swap uh, uh, operation. Well, we got A, but now B's back in the list, right? And that violates the semantics of our allocator protocol. So this is actually a classic concurrency bug. Uh, it's called the ABA problem. Um, but it's, it's only a problem for us because of our workload, right? We've defined that we need to have multiple concurrent, uh, uh, effectively, readers and writers to our allocation pool. Um, depending on your workload, you may not actually need to solve this problem, uh, depending on sort of the amount of state that you care about from your structure uh, and uh, the number of concurrent processes that you have on either side of maybe the push or pop operation or whatever other operations you might have on, on another similar structure. Um, so solving this problem costs definitely time overhead. It can also cost memory overhead. The, the way that we're going to solve it does. Um, so it's definitely something to keep in mind as to whether you can change your workload to one that doesn't have to solve it. Um, for our purposes, we do. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a generation onto our stack. And this is just like a counter, and it's basically going to count the number of allocations that happened. right? Uh, this is providing additional state into our structure that we can use to check the validity of our assumptions based on our snapshot at the beginning. So by introducing this counter, uh, uh, if we're checking it, we can, we can pop A off the stack, and then we can push B and push A. And then we can't actually ever have ABA happen because the pop would have incremented the generation counter from anybody who had read it the first time. So what does this look like in code? Well, instead of using our objects, like we used to have uh, object pointer AB up here, now we're representing this sort of entire slab head. And the reason that we have to do this is now we're comparing two, two words of memory that are side by side. It's important to note that these do actually have to be contiguous. The, the head pointer and the generation counter. And that's because this DCAS, this double wide CAS, it's a compare and swap operation, but it works over two, two words of memory, um, or two double words of memory in the case of you know, a 64-bit system, but whatever. I guess it depends on how you define word. Um, so this solves the problem uh, because of the reasons that I, I, I mentioned previously. Um, but another thing to point out here is that we're reading the generation before the head. And that's actually super important, uh, not actually for our allocator, but I want to point it out because if you go and you start writing your own uh, uh, concurrent data structures, this becomes very important. 
So uh, uniqueness is also a property of our allocator, and that's implied by the sort of you can't allocate the same thing twice and you can't free the same thing twice, right? That implies a uniqueness of objects in the system. So any object that you allocate is distinct from any other object. In a general purpose stack, that's not necessarily true. We might have element A that we can push onto the stack 50 million times, and it's fine, right? If we do have that case, we could have a case where a concurrent reader from the stack or somebody trying to pop reads A as the stack head, somebody else pushes another A onto the stack, and then we read the generation counter, right? So now we see A at the front, and we have the latest generation counter, so we're going to mutate our stack uh, again, uh, and it's going to be the wrong state. So reading the generation counter first solves that because we're guaranteed that if any other operations happen, the generation counter will be different the next time or when we actually operate our compare and swap. Do we have to do the same thing for free? Well, no, free stays the same. Um, and it, it, this is really because free only depends on the stack head for state, right? The reason that we need to do this generation counter, the reason that ABA becomes a problem for us, really is because we read the stack head, we read the next element. And that joint state, that, that multi-level state, is effectively what's coming back and biting us and causing us, well, combined with our workload, as I said, coming back and biting us to, to cause the ABA problem. OK, well, it turns out that that's uh, actually all of the problems, um, because I'm not going to talk about cache coherency or memory ordering in this talk. Um, so that's all basically the race conditions that we're going to see here. Uh, so we've, we've solved this problem. Now we have a correct concurrent lock-free uh, slab allocator. OK, so what does the throughput look like? That's great. That's predictable, right? We have the, this is the same test, uh, but with our concurrent allocator, uh, we see that as we increase contention, uh, in some cases, we're getting even better throughput, right? It, it looks linear, uh, definitely looks linear on the logarithmic plot. But why is this, right? Like, what, what is it about this property of lock freedom uh, that, that's really helping us out so much. Well, to do that, we need to look at something other than throughput. Like, throughput's great, but it doesn't tell you the whole story. And in particular, we need to look at latency plots. Okay, so this is uh, um, min-max and uh, 25th to 75th uh, quartiles box and whiskers plots um, of our test and test and set lock. That was the, the test and set with the, the uh, nested loop. Um, and what we see is that Sort of in the general case, up to 75th percentile, we've got pretty reasonable latency. But from 75th to max value, uh, we, we've got this just enormous variation. It's unpredictable. And this is because of the lack of progress guarantee from the lock. You, you aren't guaranteed to make progress. And this introduces jitter. Additionally, it in, in, uh, introduces a queuing effect into the system. So if you're familiar with Little's law, um, that can sort of explain this, this jitter and latency. It, it takes your system out of a stable state. Um, I should also mention uh, that I have also skimmed the top 1% off of these numbers to you know, just account for any like, huge amount of system jitter that might have been introduced. And it's skimmed off of all of these plots. Um, I haven't talked about pthreads a lot. Uh, I suspect that a number of people are using pthreads for reasons that have to do with um, having more threads than you have cores in the system, which is a good case for not using spin locks, in fact. Um, but what we see here is that we actually have significant variance uh, in distribution from our 25th to 75th percentile as well. And we're also still in the same order of magnitude on our y-axis here. So when we look at our uh, exponential back off spin lock, in general, it seems fine. But we still, at, from, from 75th percentile to max, we still have all of this jitter, uh, all of this variance even though uh, we've, we've uh, decreased latency by an order of magnitude. So uh, this decrease in latency is actually the only thing that is giving our test and set spin lock additional throughput. And this comes back, back to Little's law, right, which says that the uh, number of uh, uh, outstanding items in a queuing system, in an, uh, average outstanding items in a queuing system, is equal to the arrival rate of new requests, so contention on the log, right, plus the time it takes to service a request, so latency of the lock. Um, because we were able to reduce the latency in our exponential back off spin lock, that's the only reason that we got the throughput. 
Uh, but because of the queuing effect of locks, that is why our throughput still remains unpredictable under uh, uh, high contention. So finally, let's look at our latency for our concurrent allocator. That looks really good, right? That is predictable, right? We're two orders of magnitude down. Um, the, the deviation between min and max is still in the same order of magnitude. Um, everything looks really good. This is what we need, right? Under, under contention, actually, uh, it performed, or under no contention, it performed worse. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about that uh, afterwards if you're interested. Um, but as we add contention, we see that we still get this very predictable uh, latency. And that gives us our throughput. Again, this is uh, uh, that coupled with the progress guarantee gives us the throughput um, uh, consistency as we add contention on the structure. So takeaways. Well, one thing that I really want to drive home, because I think maybe I didn't do it enough, is that racing processes with each other, it, it's not uh, only like common when, when we're addressing uh, throughput and latency issues in our software, it actually is kind of a crucial part of designing uh, non-blocking algorithms. Uh, it's a crucial part of trying to um, uh, improve throughput in perhaps our locking functions where we see that um, doing something that reduces uh, latency can help us uh, increase throughput um, by, by racing these processes in a, a, a way that's friendlier to the system. Um, and, and furthermore, we can do that safely because our, our systems provide us with these atomic read, modify, write primitives like test and set, like compare and, uh, compare and swap, fetch and fee, you know, whatever uh, operation you want to do. Um, and, and these linearization points provide us with a total globally observable order between all processes in the system that they all agree on all the time because it linearizes. Good. So that's, uh, that's, we're wrapping it up. Um, I definitely did not cover all of the things about a slab allocator or performance things that you want to keep in mind, uh, in particular per thread slabs, what to do when your slab uh, is out of memory, stealing from elsewhere, that kind of stuff. If you're interested in this code or using this in your systems, um, definitely check, uh, check out uslab.io. Um, which right now is just redirecting to our, our GitHub page. We've uh, open sourced this and um, it's under the Apache 2 license. Um, also, before I wrap up, I want to th uh, thank my colleague Nathan Taylor. Um, so he actually presented this talk at Surge yesterday, um, but the conferences were happening concurrently, so I couldn't be at both. Um, <laughs> Uh, I also really can't overstate how much he helped uh, both with uh, content and you know, teasing out bugs and some of the testing stuff uh, and you know, giving these slides a consistent total order. Um, so that's all I've got for you. Thank you for coming. Um, if you've got questions, I think there's only two minutes left. So uh, I'm going to head out to the Fastly booth that's just down the hall. Uh, so feel free to come see me and, and ask questions there. Um, and thank you for coming.